This is Smart Poker Study, episode 196, answering your questions about stopping the Zoom, taking live poker notes, and pop-up stats. I hope you did not miss last week's episode number 195. In that episode, I gave you strategies to employ to help you pull the trigger on those positive EV aggressive plays. It's poker study time, y'all. Thank you so much. I really do appreciate the fact that you tune in and that you tell a friend. I'm really impressed by how many of you share the show with other poker playing pals of yours. And speaking of being impressed, I'm super impressed by James McLean, my newest supporter on Patreon. He just started up this past week. James, thank you so very much. For anyone else who wants to follow in James's footsteps, you can go to patreon.com slash smart poker study to start your support. Your support shows me that you enjoy the show and that you want me to keep on this podcasting terrain. Of course, there are different levels of support, so go to patreon.com slash smartpokerstudy to choose your level and begin that support. I really do appreciate it. Alrighty, we have three questions today coming to us from listeners CB, Jordan, and Mark. Make sure you head to the show notes page for everything I discussed today, along with screenshots and links at www.smartpokerstudy.com slash pod196. And while you're there, please sign up for the weekly boost for exclusive poker strategy direct to your inbox. Let's rock it, gambate! This is damn exciting stuff. Alrighty, question one today comes to us from CB, and uh, it's kind of a longer email. I'm just going to hit the important details right now. This is what CB says. I still can't even beat 5NL Zoom after four years. I can't afford expensive products like Poker Tracker or subscriptions to advanced training software or coaches. I am a very formulaic thinker and try to develop optimal lines given specific situations. Post-flop play is still incredibly frustrating, even when I know advanced poker concepts. They just don't seem to be helping. I will stack off with what many sites consider reasonable hands for stacking, only to have my opponent show up consistently with a better hand. Thanks from CB. Alrighty, thank you so much for that question, CB. I appreciate it. Yeah, it sounds like you got a lot of stuff going on here, and I can understand that frustration when you're still stuck at 5NL games after four years. But let's see if I can't help you here. So the first thing is stop playing Zoom. It really is antithetical to profitable poker. You must employ table and seat selection, and of course, Zoom doesn't allow for that. You know, you just get bounced from table to table. Sure, your position switches. You know, your first you're in the EP, then the MP, then the cutoff, then the button, blah, blah, blah. But you might have lags on your left for the entire session. It might be a perfect session, and you're constantly put at tables with fish. I mean, you just don't know. The thing is, the number of hands that you play doesn't matter, and that's why a lot of people play Zoom, because they don't want to be bored, they like the excitement, fold a hand, get dealt another hand right away. But the number of hands you play does not matter. What matters is making good decisions and putting yourself in money-making situations. And that's what table selection and seat selection allows you to do. Okay, the next thing for you, CB, is you need to study and you need to play with purpose. I didn't mention it when I was reading your email, but you said in the email that you do a lot of studies, right? But do you focus on one topic each week, and do you play with intent on practicing that one topic? So here's a couple of examples on focusing everything around one topic. First, you might study a full week on being the aggressor in two-bet pots, basically meaning that you're raising over limpers or just coming uh, you know, when it's folded to you, coming in with that first raise. You want to use preflop ranges that you've found or maybe that you've developed, but before every single button click, say aloud why you are making the raise. If you just say something like, well, it's in my range, that's truly not good enough, you know. What you want to say is something like, the button folds a lot, so I will have post-flop position. The small blind is tight, so he'll likely fold, and that will leave me heads up with the fishy big blind, and that's a good money-making spot. So your entire week is focused on making good open raises and isolation raises, of course. Not just in your play, but in your studies as well. So you want to work on those ranges, maybe tweak them a little bit, maybe find different preflop ranges from different people online, and also look up a lot of different two-bet preflop strategies, whether it's stealing strategies, or isolation strategies, or narrowing your ranges when you know you have a lot of lags on your left, or whatever it is, just do a lot of two-bet preflop pot studies. Let's say you want to work on your C-bet game, right? Another example of spending an entire week is maybe you're going to study facing C-bets. 
Now, if you're facing C bets, that means you called preflop. Let's assume right now that your call was positive EV. Uh, if you're not sure you're making positive EV calls, you might want to study that first before you study uh, facing C bets, of course. So you're making good preflop calls. You have to now study board texture and how different ranges interact with different boards. Not only your calling ranges, but also your opponent's open raising and isolation ranges. You want to study CBET stats and double barrel stats. You want to find opponents within your database who are like flop honest and maybe they only fire on the flop with a pair or greater and the best draws. You also want to study your opponents, the hands that they CBET that went to showdown. And for those opponents that do a lot of double barreling, you know, their, their turn C-bet stat is really high, like 60 or 70% or greater, study those showdown hands as well to see what kind of hands they are double barreling. And then as you're playing and you face a C-bet, ask yourself, what is this opponent C-betting here? If there are plenty of bluffs in their range, then you can continue with a wider range. You can also attempt to be using some C-bet raises, like uh, raising in position or check raising versus those C-bets, and try to do it for value and for bluffs as well. And before you decide to continue against a flop C-bet, make a plan for turn and river play. If you're going to call, what future cards are going to help or hurt you? If you're going to raise and they call, what future cards are going to help or hurt you again? Also think about the villain's range. What cards could he be c-betting with? What cards will he likely double barrel on? What cards is he going to check give up on once you fire on the turn? And of course, think about the bet sizing that your opponent could be using on future streets. And also look at that stack to pot ratio and see how that develops as more bets are going to be going in on future streets. Alrighty, so those were two examples of studying and playing with purpose on two different topics right there. So whatever you need to work on CB, uh, just choose one thing at a time and spend that entire week studying and playing around it. And here's another thing. You had mentioned stacking off with reasonable hands and your opponents just show up with better hands. Well, that's the kind of thing that happens. You know, you need to work on your mental game. Tilty things like that happen all the time. I mean, you've seen this opponent get it in preflop with pocket fours, pocket eights, and pocket nines. You have pocket queens, right? You're way ahead of all those other pairs that they're capable and that you've seen them get it in with in the past. Well, if they just happen to have kings this time versus your queens, well, that's a bummer. You made the best play you could given the information that you had uh, from prior encounters with this uh, opponent. What you need to do to work on that mental game of yours and not getting angry and not tilting over these kinds of things is first figure out what sends you on tilt and then work to overcome it. Now, I imagine that you've read the mental game of poker. Please reread that book and dedicate one entire month, not just a week, one month to getting the most from this book. Fill out Jared Tendler's questionnaire that he gives you within the book. I don't think he gives it in the book. Maybe he does. I don't remember. But yeah, at a minimum, he gives a link to download it. So fill out that questionnaire. Oh, actually, I'll put the link in the show notes for everybody listening right now. You can download that questionnaire there. It's just something free on his website. The questionnaire is pretty darn long and detailed. But once you fill it out, be completely honest with yourself. Once you fill it out fully, you're going to have a better understanding of what puts you on tilt and how your tilt or I guess how your anger and your tilt manifests itself. And then in that book, he gives you tons of logic statements to help you with various uh, forms of tilt. But of course, you can create your own, you know. And then for that entire month, your sole focus is working on keeping cool during your play sessions and then studying hands and studying situations that put you on tilt. Now, here's something, CB. This is so simple right here. Buy Poker Tracker and Flopzilla. I don't care if you think these are too expensive for you. Poker Tracker, if you're playing in the minimum stakes, I think it's like only 60 bucks for like the cheapest version that only records cash game hands at the micro stakes. 60, bu 60 bucks is nothing. Flopzilla is only 30 or $40. I can't remember exactly. Whatever it is, at most you're paying 100 bucks for these two products. I know you can work a few more hours at whatever job. You can skip some lunches. You can eat freaking ramen for the next month to save up 100 bucks and buy these programs. You've got to buy them in order to get the most out of your poker play sessions and your poker study sessions. In the email, you had also mentioned that post-flop play is a big problem for you. Well, I'm not going to dive too deep into post-flop play, but here's a few things right here. If you're betting for value post-flop, it's because you believe your opponent can call with worse hands. But before you click that bet button, name the worst hands that they're calling with. When you bet as a bluff, know that they can fold some good hands. And once again, name those hands that they can fold. 
And if you face any big bets or raises, or even just like a standard double barrel, something like that, ask yourself, do I beat the worst hands they're making this play with? If the answer is no, then you've got to be folding, right? Uh, for example, they double barrel, let's say the board is ace, king, 10, 8. And you call the preflop with ace, 9. So you have a top pair with a crappy kicker, right? So if they can double barrel with ace, 7, or worse, or maybe a random pair of kings, or like a queen or a jack that has a gut shot draw, even a pair, like pair plus gut shot draw, jack 10, queen 10 kind of hands, then you can go ahead and call as long as they're making this play with hands that you beat. But if they're only barreling with ace-queen or ace-jack or better than one pair hands, you've got to fold. Let your opponents tell you what they have with the way they play their hands and their bet sizing. Don't just call post-flop or even raise post-flop in hopes that your hand is good or that you can get them to fold. All right, two last things. I know this is a long answer to this question, but you brought up just so many uh, issues that many players have right here. The next thing I recommend is do a daily hand reading practice every single day. You can go to YouTube and find my 66 days of hand reading videos and do exactly that for 66 days. Make sure you choose a hand that's related to the topic that you're studying that week. And doing this practice over and over, I guarantee is gonna make you a better pre-flop, a better post-flop player, just better all around. And you mentioned a few times in your email about optimal lines. Don't think about optimal lines. If you think you have the best hand and your opponent can pay you off with worse, then bet for value. If they show some kind of strength, especially on the Turner River, they have two pair or greater, and you can easily fold all of those one pair hands. I want you to start believing your opponents more when they tell you they've got the goods with their bet sizing and their actions. Also, when you flop a value hand, Ask yourself how many streets of value can you get. If it's a top pair hand, that's often worth one or two streets of value. A set, often three streets of value. A second pair hand, maybe one or two streets of value, but often you're just going to be calling and hoping to get to showdown pretty cheap against aggressive players who are capable of bluffing against you. Alrighty, thank you so much for that question, CB, and I'm sure all of that, uh, I'm, I'm, well, I'm not sure it's going to help you. I hope it's going to help you, but I'm sure everybody listening, you can grab one thing out of all of that and pursue it this next week for sure. Alrighty, the second question today comes to us from Jordan, and it's about taking live poker notes. Here's his question. When you play live sessions, how do you record hands? Is there an app where you enter in stats as you go, or do you use the old-fashioned notepad? I realize I have leaks in this area, but because I only play live and not online, it can be hard to track and know my stats. Thanks. Alrighty, well, thank you, Jordan, for that question. So you had asked about apps, right? And I, there's no really good apps that I know of for just recording hand histories. My favorite way to do it is via Evernote. Uh, if you're using Evernote at the table, it's going to look like you're just texting. You know, do it away from the table or under the table. And I'll talk a little bit more, a bit about the hand details to record in a second. But also, you could have a notepad at the table like you had mentioned. And that's quick and natural for an old guy like me to use. But the downside is that everyone sees what you're doing. They might not know the notes that you're making, but they know obviously that, hey, this guy over here in seat five, he's taking notes on a notepad. This guy is obviously taking the game seriously. Uh, you don't want your opponents to know that you're taking the game seriously. You want them to think that, hey, maybe he's good. Maybe he knows what he's doing, but maybe he's just here having fun as well, right? Don't give them any indication that you're actively working on your game. Now, you had mentioned apps, of course. There are apps for like bankroll management, uh, apps like that are called like Poker Manager, and there's another one called Poker Income Tracker. But that's for tracking uh, just how your sessions go, how long you spend at the, t at the sessions, what days are best for you, how much money you're making per hour, that kind of thing. There is one app called Share My Pair, and that's where you can share your hands. People can watch a video replay of the hand that you input there. Now, you don't want to use this app for actually recording hands that you play. Uh, it just takes too much time to input a hand. You want to do this later to share important hands to get insights from your friends and stuff through the Share My Pair app. So what I want you to do is strictly use Evernote or another kind of text-based note-taking app for your phone. And here's what you want to record for the hands you play. You want to record the positions of the players involved, the stack sizes, and then, of course, your whole cards. And then you want very simple street-by-street -street actions with sizings. And the sizing can be in terms of dollars or the pot percentage. 
And that's really it. If you just practice with this for a little bit, you'll start taking really good notes that allows you to replay the hand in your head or on a piece of paper when you're away from the table back home, that kind of thing. And you had mentioned stats. Now, there's no, as far as I know, there's no apps for recording your live stats like VPIP and PFR and stuff. And you don't want to calculate this stuff as you play. What you want to do is, using that same Evernote, uh, you want to record the number of instances and do the math in a spreadsheet later. Now, here are the numbers that you want to record, right? Every time you're dealt into a hand, make a little tick mark. Every time you VPIP, make a tick mark. Every time you raise preflop, tick mark. Call a 2-bet, tick mark. 3-bet, tick mark. Call a 3-bet and 4-bet, make a tick mark after each of those. For post-flop play, you want to record the number of flops seen, and then you want to record or you know make a tick mark for every C-bet you make or every call of a C-bet. You also want to make a tick mark for every raise C-bet that you make and every fold to C-bet that you make. And then do those same numbers for the turn. And then afterwards, when you go home, you could just whip out those numbers, use an Excel spreadsheet or a piece of paper and a pencil, of course, and just figure out your stats for yourself. But ultimately, Jordan, I think the most important thing for you to do in order to start learning from your stats and your style of play is to play some online poker. You could play at 2NL or 5NL like CB does, or if your bankroll lets you 10NL, 25NL. And what you want to do is play online. You know, try to visualize that you're actually in a card room in a live setting right now and play like you would live. That way, your stats are going to naturally accumulate. You're going to have hand history saved for you to review later on. And it's just going to be a much better way to study the hands that you play. You could still do all the live work that you need to to improve that live game. But utilize online play as an area to work on your game on the cheap. Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash smartpokerstudy. They have over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. And of course, they have How to Study Poker Volume 1 and Volume 2, and they have Preflop Online Poker. And speaking of preflop online poker, Michael Mateo left a five-star review in Amazon for this book. Here's the title of it. This book is a must for any online poker player. Here's what he said. Sky goes through the preflop fundamentals every player needs to be working on. The book is written in a way where every skill builds on top of the previous skill. It focuses on learning one skill completely and then building upon it with the next skill. At the end of each skill, he gives the reader the steps to practice and reinforce the skill. It's a great book for online players using poker tracking software and HUDs. He includes the stats that are most important to focus on for the skill being taught. I would recommend this book to any online player. Well, thank you so much, Michael. I really do appreciate those kind words, uh, you know, in the Amazon review. So for anybody else who's purchased the book, please leave a review right there on Amazon because it basically helps to spread the word, puts the book higher up in the charts. So when somebody just searches for online poker or pre-flop poker, whatever they search for, it'll appear higher on the list. So they will see it and buy it. And then one more quick shout out. Carol Lieb purchased the Smart Hut. I'm telling you, this Smart Hut is selling like hotcakes. So get in on the action. Get that Poker Tracker 4 Smart Hut for yourself by going to smartpokerstudy.com slash smart hut. Thank you so much, Carol. Alrighty, back to class, poker people. Now, question three today comes to us from Mark, and it's about pop-up stats. And he said very simply in his email, need help with pop-up stats. Alrighty, thank you, Mark. So when it comes to understanding and utilizing pop-up stats, there are three things that I recommend. Number one is focus on one stat per week and study it. So for example, the three bet, you know, that's a stat that everybody wants to learn more and learn how to uh, uh, utilize it for exploiting opponents. So what you need to do is learn everything you can about this stat and how players use it to make optimal decisions. You want to look for videos on YouTube or on your favorite training site that discuss the concept in detail. And you want to know the formula and how it's calculated, of course. You want to also look at your own stat by position and analyze what hands you're three betting from each position. And because you're diving into your database, you might as well pull up some of your loosest opponent stats and review their three bet stats by position. Also, Look at the three bet hands that they've shown down to get an idea of the hands that they're three betting with and compare them to the percentages that they have developed in each position. 
Make sure you know exactly where the stat is within your HUD and within your pop-ups. You want to color code the stat or enlarge the font or something to make it more noticeable as you play and refer to it all the time as you play. All right, the second thing you need to do is focus on this one stat in each session that you play this week. Pay attention to this statistic in everyone's HUD so you can pick out the frequent 3-betters and start to develop a plan against them. You're also going to notice those who rarely 3-bet, so you can start to plan how to react to their 3-bets. And when anyone makes a 3-bet, whether you're involved in the hand or not, open up the pop-up to look at their stat by position and quickly try to determine what likely hands fall within that percentage. If you're facing the 3-bet, make the most appropriate fold, call, or 4-bet once you've looked at their stat and gauged the range that they're using. And if you're not involved in the hand, just continue watching the whole hand. Maybe it gets to showdown and try to confirm whether or not uh, the hand that you put them on, or I'm sorry, the hand that they end up having fell within the range that you first thought they could have there in preflop. All right, the third step. Off the felt, you want to run some range and equity calculations using percentages of your opponents. So, for example, let's say your opponent, over 2,000 hands, they have a 3-bet of 11% on the button, 9% in the cutoff, and 5% in early position. You want to ask yourself questions like, what ranges fit each percentage? What hands can I 4-bet with, and how often will they fold? How often will they call or 5-bet given this 3-bet range? Alrighty, thank you again so much for this question, Mark. Challenge! Here's my challenge to you for this episode. I know there was something I said in one of my answers that struck a chord with you. Maybe it was about utilizing Evernote to record live hands. Maybe it was about focusing on one stat at a time in your HUD and your pop-ups. Or maybe it was about never playing Zoom again. Choose the one thing that you think will make the biggest impact to your game and get to work. Today's a new day, and you've got the opportunity to improve your game for the better. Now it's your turn to take action, and shabba do something positive for your poker game. Oh, that's it now. Get out there and be somebody. Go write a book. This episode isn't complete until you head to the show notes page at www.smartpokerstudy.com slash pod 196 for screenshots and links to everything discussed today. And of course, to discover ways in which you can support the podcast and keep me rolling. Thank you so much for listening today. If you haven't done it already, please subscribe and leave a review for the podcast within your favorite podcatching app. Reviews and of course, word of mouth are the best ways to help the show grow. If you can type or say the word Smart Poker Study, you can find me on Alexa, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, Twitch, and Instagram. And please, send me questions, sky at smartpokerstudy.com. Okay, poker people, next week in episode 197, I'm going to hit you up with a brand new leak to plug. Word of mouth is the best advertising, so thank you very much for sharing the show with other poker people. Your sharing and caring is what helps us grow. Until next time, study smart. Play much and make your next session the best one yet.